Okay, I am uh, here with David Templeman, who has an interesting background when it comes to uh, thinking about emergency response and extreme weather. David, tell us a bit about uh, the role you previously had. Well, I was in the role of the Director General of Emergency Management Australia for s nearly six years, from 2000 to two early 2006. Uh -huh. And I suppose that I had a, an opportunity, if you can call it that, to have been um, involved in just about every specific major event that impacted on Australia during that particular period of time, whether it was in Australia or whether it was offshore. Okay. And whether that ranged from things like Oh, the return of the Mir space station in 2001, to cyclones and, and, and earthquakes in the Pacific, to things like the Bali bombings in 2002 and subsequently in 2005, uh, major bushfire activity within Australia during that period of time, um, the Indian Ocean tsunami in Okay, I'm getting the picture that you have something to say. <laughs> So tell us, you're, you're now out of that sector and you have, you know, a little bit of a helicopter view. Mm -hmm. um, are you concerned about, you know, first of all, I guess, this perception that there might be an increasing risk on extreme weather in particular um, as the climate system uh, begins to, to maybe shift as a result of a warming planet? Does this, do you think this is relevant in terms of the emergency response system? Well, I think this is all very relevant in terms of thinking about our emergency management planning nationally, as far as Australia and the region is concerned. I mean, it's no secret that we're going to see extreme weather events. We've already seen the impact of that. We've seen the impact of Cyclone Nargis on, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Burma. We saw also Cyclone Larry, its impact on Innisfail. Heaven forbid what it would have been like if it had actually gone into Cairns. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the devastating sort of fire activity in Victoria. But really go back about five or six years, we saw an increase and we continue to see an increase in severe storm activity, particularly mm -hmm. on the east coast of Australia. They've seen events happening there which the they never storms, predicted all of were that, going yes. to actually occur. Sudden storms, sudden yeah. drop of, you know, in massive rain in that particular period of time. Yes. You know, localised flooding, lots of damage, lots of inundation. Okay, so we, we have an issue to have prepare a big for. Issue, we have a big issue. And we have a big issue basically about getting our communities. So, you know, clearly we, we have an issue um, and the community, I think, needs a little bit more engagement, a bit more information to understand, you know, what is happening and how do they get involved. What do you see as some good ideas to actually kind of communicate with the public in, in a slightly different way? Well, first of all, we need to actually start a process of really genuinely communicating with people about sharing information mm -hmm. and not hiding it. Secondly, we need to actually get some runs on the board about it. We're going to talk about building community resilience. Let's start looking at some pretty simple, quick fix type like things. Like what? What's a good like idea? Like first aid for families and schools and okay. things like this. Yeah. Would go down fantastically well. And, and, and who is doing that kind of work? Are there models around the world that could be good to... Uh, well, to... if you looked at, say, what's happening in Canada at the moment, uh -huh. they've put in a national plan about getting the community prepared for the first 72 hours. Right getting them involved and looking at things like what do they need for that first 72 hours of survival mm -hmm. if no one's going to look after you. Mm -hmm. New Zealand's got a thing called what's the plan stand? Mm -hmm. What have we got in Australia? I mean, Nothing. you know, and, and it's interesting. I mean, th there's that terrific Red Cross, you know, four-step four readiness plan and that's the content is there. I guess what you're saying is the, the leadership that really puts it on the map in a really vivid way, that's what you're really looking for. Absolutely. And I think if you talk to certain people like Fiona Wood, who's a very renowned former Australian of the Year, burn specialist in Australia, mm -hmm. one of the things that she will say and ask a person, mm -hmm. what are the basic principles you need to know about first aid? You know, stop, drop, roll and manage. Mm -hmm. I asked 300 children that the other day yep. and one of them in the audience okay. knew what to do. Okay, so we're talking very basic uh, awareness. Absolutely. Very... And Look, it costs let's... only $40 probably to each year to do let someone do a, get a first aid certificate. That sounds like a smart thing. Let, 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 let's shift the debate. You know, we, we understand that Australia has an aging population mm -hmm. that will put pressure on our public services as uh, those of us that, you know, need access to things like health care, get, get, get older and, and more frail. We also have a very vibrant multicultural community with a lot of change and so forth. And within that context, we have this massive volunteer base that supports us through uh, extreme weather emergency, you know, 500,000 people. What are some of the issues around um, the aging of that base and how to broaden uh, engagement right across the community? Well, firstly, let me just say one thing. The, av the com average person in the community doesn't even know 
that we have this 500,000 people volunteers. Yeah, that's they right. think that someone who's in yellow or orange overalls who turns up, that they think they're paid and career staff. Right. So we've got to overcome a culture of actually uh-huh. understanding their volunteers. We've got to celebrate that contribution. Absolutely. Yep. And, f- and secondly, we can't have people who are the average age of a volunteer in Australia. It varies. Sometimes people say 47 or 50. Yeah. I mean, really, people doing highly dangerous highly specialised work, we've got to grow this volunteer effort into our next generation. Yeah. And if we're going to end up as a population in Australia, in 2030, I think someone said to me recently, we'll have 25% of our population will be over 65. Yeah. So not only will that bring greater pressure on the national economy, yes. how are we going to actually grow this volunteer workforce in the meantime when we've got such a diverse community from a variety of backgrounds? Yes, yes, it's a challenge. So, I mean, in some ways, the message is bring it down to a community level, refresh it with younger people, and really focus on the scale of the risk, which seems to be growing. What, what, what are the other messages? I mean, if you could do small things that had a big bang for the buck, you know, in your dreams, what are they? <laughs> Now's your chance. You're running the system. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> well, I think we've actually really got to make these, these, these big investments in, in, in resilience as far as the, the, the community yeah. is concerned. But really, I want to be, I want to see a champion out there. Mm-hmm. Who's actually taking some leadership around this? Brad Pitt. <laughs> Who is going to be the go-to yes. person or the go-to person? organisation. Yeah. I don't see that at the moment. Yeah. We see some funny ideas that come about, giving people who might get rid of their hex debt mm-hmm. by going and volunteering. We don't want to have make work issues like mm-hmm. that. Put the investment back into volunteers. Mm-hmm. Volunteers make a contribution, a great personal contribution. They don't want to be paid. Mm-hmm. That, that make that. But they all do incur a lot of personal and family costs in mm-hmm. that. We could make a contribution in Australia of, say, $500 per person mm. per year mm-hmm. to contribute to, say, their, per, their personal petrol mm-hmm. and other maybe car registration costs to do training and to attend events. Mm. Now, that's a simple thing. It could be done. Sure, when you add it up in terms of active volunteers... It's a lot of money. ...cost a lot of money. Yeah. But it's a big commitment to show that we're seriously committed about doing something about this. Yeah. And I guess the other way of looking at that is... Um, Let's take that, that horror scenario where you, you do have a slight shift and, and we do have a major cyclone in, in a population area like Hans or, or further south. The cost of not making these investments, uh, if we're picking up the pieces with a really frail capacity, I guess is significant. It is huge. And the other thing too that also gets impacted on all of this is that do we ever recognise where these people work normally? Their mm-hmm. businesses, yes. they need to get con- some consideration in yeah. this. It's Especially just, small businesses. It's taken really for granted. Tough. Yeah, we yes. can't afford to continue to take them for granted. So they need yeah. some sort of supplementation if they're going to give people and let people go and do volunteering and a type of work. So there's a big thing here to be wrestled with, yeah. and it's serious stuff and requires some serious levels of engagement by all the states and territories, including the federal government. Mm -hmm. Sensational. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's okay.